Um, I did right. get I did get your your note though that uh, a lot of content has changed. Um, yeah, a good significant chunk of it has changed quite a bit. Well, um, I mean, I can share my screen now while everybody's kind of jumping in. But um, so, if you haven't seen the latest version, right, you can see my screen, right? Uh, let me go back over here. Yes, I sure can. So a lot of it's like, I mean, some of it's stuff we've already talked about, so it's not too bad, but you can see that they're starting to like organize it into subsections. And I so, see. Okay. Okay. Which was reassuring that testing was broken up into three chapters because the first initial chapter that was, was huge. No, that was 20 some topics in that, in that one, in that one uh, chapter. Yeah, so it was a significant amount of chapters. So I was glad to see that they broke it up into three because when I was like, well, this is, and they've added some more materials too to testing. So um, I actually, yeah, you're right because vignettes was chapter 11. Now that's not chapter 11 anymore. That's yeah. now down at 17. Chapter 12 was, was uh, or was it nine and 10 was licensing? Nine was licensing, 10, 10. Yeah, wow, that's 12. Yeah, no, this is a lot different, isn't it? Yeah, so things have changed. Um, you know, we'll probably talk with the group here. I know Brendan wanted to do like description and names or wanted to do namespace because we've already talked about the description. Correct. And then dependencies goes along with namespace. So these two chapters are related. <clears throat> and then we've already talked about function documentation. We've already talked about vignettes, but like other markdown files and website just popped up, but I was just looking at them. Website's not even done. Like there's just like a skeleton to it. And then there's other markdown files. So you know what's crazy is as they push to GitHub or they're compiling it for the book so that the, the URL resolves, it's, it's crazy that it's not actually, you know, in a, in a print form, publishing form. Like uh, my reference is going to the GG plot book. There was some considerable changes that were in version three. Um, most of what we've read online is all version two. And so you'll notice if you go to the, the source, the GitHub site and, and look at the source of the content, uh, majority of it has been committed, you know, what, three, four or five years ago. Um, it hasn't modified. I don't know what the new URL is, the new site. Uh, path. It may be in private mode too. Um, hasn't been made public yet, but like if they're, if they're committing the changes immediately, the next person that goes to the site, they're going to get an updated version. I don't know. Yeah. Just a, a thought of configuration management and all. And, yes. and oh, go ahead. Go well, ahead. from a, from a work perspective, this is one of the driving forces that I continually ask our team, the engineers, the group that I'm working with is to put their content in an online format. Don't go to print. Don't, don't create PDF documents, print paper documents, because they're, uh, are, or, or, or make it in a, a downloadable PDF, because what you'll find is a lot of our field service staff, they'll download the PDF to their local laptop. They'll never go back to the source. So in essence, they're just really often very behind on a lot of the, the media that they're dealing with. I've always asked that we put it in an online format so that here's your web URL. You just go to the link. Well, the complaint about that is, well, we don't always have internet connection where we're at. And mm -hmm. that's agreeable. I understand that. So it's, it's always fighting this battle of the field service team to go to the website. I don't know. I, 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 I'm appreciative of constant updates and or changes being made, maybe not in this book club context, but <laughs> so. Yeah, so uh, for, for people that have joined, um, if you haven't seen my note yet in the R Packages <clears throat> channel for the book club, um, they made some other changes to the book. <laughs> so they've updated it again. Um, I don't think it's anything drastic. Uh, it's just mainly like a reorganization. So uh, I was just talking with Ryan about like some of the stuff that's kind of changed, um, which was kind of reassuring because I was telling Ryan with testing, I was a little worried, like I wasn't moving fast enough. But then when I realized it was like, they broke it up into three chapters, it made me feel a lot better because I was like, oh, okay, this makes me 
what I was thinking about getting it done in two weeks, well, technically we'd probably be worth going over in three, but um, I think we could maybe probably kind of truck through it tonight and see how far we can get. Um, I don't see Brendan on the call, but uh, I know he wanted to do like <clears throat> namespace. Well, namespace now doesn't have its own chapter. Now it's like, it's integrated into this like package metadata section. And so, um, so if you had an idea of what you wanted to do, uh, it may have changed. And so I'm gonna have to go through our schedule here and kind of check and see what has changed. And, and I already see Rex has gotten releasing a package. So I think that one's, it's, it's kind of there. Um, so yeah, we, we may have to, we may have to kind of rethink a little bit and um, kind of put you in a different spot or maybe you can do like two chapters or something. I don't know, something we can talk about, but yeah. So uh, this has been updated. So if you wouldn't mind looking over it and checking out what's changed, um, do that. So uh, I really appreciate everybody joining in tonight. Um, I think it's already 8.06. So I think we probably should, um, get moving on with our conversation tonight. Uh, I'm going to try my best to get through uh, a good chunk of testing tonight if I can. Um, you know, uh, there's some stuff in here that uh, I came across, especially within like the advanced techniques where I've never been exposed to some of those things, some of those ideas. So some of it I may kind of skim over a little bit, kind of talk high level, but if there's something that like people want to like really dive into or try and figure out or have like um, interest in talking about more, please let me know. Let's let's kind of dig into it because like I said, some of this like higher level advanced stuff, I was like, yeah, this is the first time I've been kind of exposed to it. But um, just as a kind of a quick recap where we were at last time. Um, Jenny Bryan was talking about like, what's the real problem? And, and really the real problem is, is that it's not that we don't test our code because, you know, most of us, we do some informal testing. The problem is, is that we just don't automate our tests. And so Jenny Bryan and, and Hadley Wickham, you know, introduced in their book, this idea of using test that. And so using the framework of the package test that to create automated testing. And so we, we, we started that conversation. We kind of talked about it at a high level uh, really kind of talked about what are some of the nitty gritty things that we need to do to set up the test that framework. Then we kind of dug into like, what does a basic test look like and how do we set that up? And again, as we know, the use this package has some really great helper functions and convenience functions to set it all up for us. So again, we can use that use R to create, you know, R files that get put into the R directory. And then if we want to create an individual test for each a uh, new R file, R function that we have, we just use test. And so it will basically create that test that framework for us, as well as setting up a basic test that skeleton in individual files for our specific functions that we're creating within our package. And so, uh, you know, we talked about kind of the basic form of what a test looks like. Uh, this is a, this would be something that would be in a test file. Again, we have that test that function where we have some type of, of string variable here, um, our string value here, which basically gets outputted anytime that we run the tests, whether that be a pass or a fail. And then um, we have our expectation, which we'll dive into a little bit more tonight. Then we kind of left off with this idea of running tests during development. And so we talked a little bit about the macro, the meso, and the micro iteration. And so really talking about, you know, when we do testing, we don't necessarily have to do our entire test suite. We don't have to run our command check every time. We can start from just the basic expectation and work up to a larger set of tests, which contains many expectations, all the way up to running a file that runs many different tests. And then our entire testing suite, whether that be running all of our test files or even running our command check, which runs the test files at the end. And so we talked about this idea of the inverted pyramid of running tests. Um, again, this was not, this was, this was my organization of the idea, but it was Jenny Bryan's idea to break it up into the macro, meso, and micro. So uh, then we left off with talking about like organizing our tests. So the big thing is to remember going back to the start of when we actually set up the test that framework, all of our tests are going to live in that directory test, test that. And so I'm going to bring in our regex excite package here, this example package here. So everyone kind of remember this one. 
So here's the project level that we have. And again, all of our tests are going to be put into tests, test that, and then you're going to have all of your tests in that test that directory. Um, one kind of the kind of the cop, not caveat, but one of the kind of the things that you want to make sure that you do, and if you're using the use test from the use this function, is that every test file that you create is going to be appended with this test dash. So again, if I go back over here to the regex excite package, you're going to see that there's two um, test files in here, and they're going to be appended by that like test dash and then test um, stir split. My assumption is, and someone can confirm or deny this for me, is, is that I'm guessing that this test dash um, is probably used by test that to run the test file, but I'm not 100% sure if that's true or not. But there has to be some reason other than like organizing it with the test dash, you know, um, something that probably the test that uses it to run it, but I'm not really 100% sure. Um, but if anybody knows, like, let me know. So uh, <clears throat> the big thing that the, the when, we, when we're thinking about organizing our tests, the book really tells us don't use library call at the top of your test files. Uh, remember our dependencies for our package should be managed through the metadata that's within our description file. And so when you're creating these test files, and this was a mistake that I was making at the start, was I was thinking that my test that files needed to have like library read R in it. That's not the case. Um, what you should be doing is you should be managing those dependencies in your description file, whether that be in your imports or your suggest field here. Um, so again, when you're creating those test files, you shouldn't see any library calls at the top. Uh, tests are organized hier hier hierarchically. Um, so basically, I kind of been thinking of it like, you know, like uh, a nesting structure of some type. So when you look at this, and this was kind of my diagram I put together <clears throat> to kind of <clears throat> remember this. So expectations is going to be referred to as like the atom of our testing. This is going to be like the smallest unit of our unit tests. And so from expectations, what we do is we can have many expectations, but then the next level up from that is our test module. And our test module contains many different expectations that we have for that specific test. So I'm going to pull this one in here and I'm going to pull up this test create, uh, no, the string split one. And this was um, Jenny Bryan's example from that first chapter that we read. Um, you can see that, you know, technically what we have here is in this test file, we have three tests for this string split one. So um, what's interesting about this is that this test here, the one that is the string split one exposes features to string, string split has those two expectations. You can have as many expectations as you want within a test. That's, I mean, within reason. I mean, you can't, you obviously want your tests to run fast, so you can't have like 10,000 tests in them. But I mean, you can have as many expectations as you want within each one of these testing structures. Now, within each test file, you're going to have multiple tests. So this example here is you have this test here that does a test for string split one. Here's the second test for here. And then it has this, second, this third test right here. So that's building up from um, that like expectation structure going up one level, which is test module. And then <clears throat> the next level would be your, your file, right? And your file holds multiple related tests, which we were talking about before. And then if you even want to go up one level higher, you're going to have your entire testing suite is kind of like the general structure of it. What questions do people have about like test organization, what it looks like within the framework of the test that package. Colin, I was gonna add a comment and I wanna to apologize to the rest of the group. I did not watch last week's video, that's on me and I apologize. What I was going to mention is in a engineering mindset, you do not wanna coerce your tests to match the code that you're writing. So you don't wanna like, I don't know, create some sort of weird edge case type detail that is only effective so that it, it sanctifies or, you know, qualifies whatever odd function that you created. Um, the thought process is more towards uh, writing your code within the boundaries of the uh, packaging framework and then 
authoring the test as a, as a validation to confirm that what variables you're passing and what you're receiving back should match. Um, so the, the idea is do some activity and then here's my expected output. And if you get anything that's different than that expected output, automatically test fail. It's a very Boolean type thought process. It's either true or false. I, it's, it's not related to this testing chapter. It's more of just a testing concept in mind uh, outside of, of uh, software development, but it does apply in this, in this uh, scenario. Yeah, so a couple of things with that. Um, last time we drew, we dove a little bit into like test driven development again. So making sure that if you are going to do TDD, and we talked about different other structures to development as well, um, you know, you're going to have your test and you're going to write your code to your test, right? Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about like expectations and like what expectations look like. Um, but like you said, it's just like you're making an assertion, right? You're making an assertion. It's a binary. Well, I, I, th I used to think it was binary, but I changed my mind. All right. I came across some other material. There's actually three responses that you can have from a test. You can have true or an expert. You have true, you can have false, and you can have unknown, right? And so, um, you know, you get that true false, but then there's also that they're unknown, but you're constrained to those three responses with your expectations. So well, the, the, the scenario I was presenting in this thought process was actually one of our teams at a particular site that was doing some systems integration and the customer had asked them to use this particular component in this, in this, uh, this uh, system, the validation test that we were conveying did not take that into account. And they were asking us to change our validation test to accommodate. And the, the engineer that, that wrote the uh, validation uh, coursework or the, the, the steps, he jumped in and says, no, 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 no. I don't know what this box is and I don't care what that box does. Our application is still gonna work the same way. So the, the thought process I have in software development is a similar concept of you don't wanna coerce things to make it pass the test. That's not, you, that's not doing any good at all. So anyway, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll stop. No, I think that's a good point. Like, right. Like we, I think remember we, we talked about this in like mastering shiny was like, yeah, you could spoof a test, right? Like if you wanted to, like, I mean, that's not the ethical thing to do, but you could spoof a test to make it pass. Um, but I mean, but I mean, at the end of the day, like if you're spoofing the test, then it's like, you're, I'm trying to remember. It's like, it's, it's hard to catch it. It's unknown if that test is passing or fit really in, you know, truth, like passing or failing because you spoofed it. Right. And so, um, and we talked, and I, I remember last week we talked a little, I know I was like, I was like, I was hoping that you were going to be there that week because I know you had that example that you just shared. And I, and I was, and we had a conversation about like, yeah, testing and what type of testing you do is context specific. And so it's like, for like e-commerce stuff, like testing may not be a big thing depending on how large your platform is, but in your industry, in the rail industry, like a train has to stay on the rails. Like you can't, like it can't, you can't, you can't just have a train go off the rails. So well, there's um, a, there's a joke that goes along with this accounting concept, right? So it's, you know, you're, you've got all these different disciplines coming in for a job interview and, you know, the, the interviewing question is, you know, what's two plus two? Well, okay. As you go through the various disciplines, you get to the accountant and the, you ask the accountant, the question is like, well, what do you want it to be? Like, that, that's not, that's not good testing. Uh, I guess that's my point. So yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. So like, that's a good segue into this idea of expectations. And so expectations are that atom of testing. And so um, that expectation is that finite, is the finest level of our testing. Again, we're trying to get it to that state where we can get those responses, whether they be true, false, or unknown. Um, and again, with expectations, they make those binary assertions. Um, is the properties of an object that our function returns as we would expect it to be. And so there might be many different expectations that we have of what gets returned from our function. And so uh, I, you know, in all honesty, like as I'm starting to go down this testing route, this is where I think the, the kind of switch in your mindset goes when you start going into like TDD, like types of development, or even thinking about testing is because you're thinking about what are the properties of the object that I'm returning. And that's where like the real thought process comes in because then it makes you really think concretely like, okay, 
yeah, before I was like, create a function. Oh, it's just going to create some type of table. I'm good to go. But then when you actually start to dig down into it a little bit further, you're like, okay, well, then you have a table. Then what types of columns are going to be there? Like it, how many columns are going to be there? How many rows are going to be there? What are the column names? And so having this kind of testing framework gets you to that point of thinking about not just like what's the thing that gets returned, but what specifically gets returned from your function. And so, um, you know, that was kind of my epiphany when I started doing testing was like, it really makes you think, what are you going to like, what are you expecting to get returned? Uh, these are not qualitative assertions. Uh, they are quantitative. So the way I kind of think of it is, is that when we write our expectations, we need to write them in a way that the computer can evaluate it in some way. So you can't be like, you can't make an expectation of that. You can't make an expectation or you can't write an expectation to say whether a color scheme is good. So you can't be like, hey, computer, is my UI, um, does my UI look good? The computer is not going to be able to answer that question, right? But it can answer the question of, uh, is this specific button red? It can do it can do that. Um, I mean, you know, there's many different shades of red, but you could get very specific if you're using some type of hexadecimal code or something to get that binary assertion of, you know, from your expectation. Um, so again, we're writing our tests or our expectations um, for the computer to actually do that. And that has to be quantitative in some way. Um, and then organization and the naming of test materials is important. So again, remember that when you're writing your tests, going back to what we talked about last time with that observation, decision, action cycle during development is, is that if we just name things that we don't know or we create names that don't mean anything or are easily forgettable or not informative in the future, or if we pass it to somebody else to work on, if our tests are failing and it's not providing that information to our developers or ourselves, it really slows that observation, decision, action type of um, development. So um, just make sure that your naming, you know, goes back to like, goes back to like the concepts when we, goes back to like the first kind of concepts when you learn how to do like the R for DS stuff, right? Naming stuff is important. Same thing for tests. So when tests fail, we wanna make sure that we get data that tells us what went wrong. So we wanna make sure that we get information about what went wrong. And then we want information to tell us where it went wrong. And so again, if we can nail down or provide data for those specific two things about what, what went wrong and where it went wrong, it's gonna speed up that ODA cycle that we talked about last time. So the structure of an expectation, again, these are kind of, um, uh, so most of the stuff was you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, anytime you create an expectation, it's gonna start with expect. Uh, there's two main arguments. You're gonna have the actual result of what you expect to be returned. And then um, you're gonna have what you expect that return will look like. And then if the actual and the expected don't agree, that's when the test that, that's when the test that package throws an error. It says, hey, your test fails. Um, if, it, if those two things match, then it's gonna say, hey, your test passed, passed. So um, there's also additional arguments that you can pass to refine the comparison. Uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. We'll talk about specific expectation examples here on the next slide. But like the example was like, if you expect an error, there was this good, there was this kind of discussion about like capturing the type that gets returned from the error. So you can add additional um, arguments to these expect functions that will say like, hey, cap say if this one specific thing is there, you know, say it passes or fails. Um, and then the test that package provides over 40 different expectations. So the book's like, hey, we're going to only cover kind of the most general ones, but know that there's pretty much any expectation that you're going to have, even to the point where if you need to create your own expectation function, there's functionality to do that. And so I linked those 40 different expectations, or I, I linked the reference section to the test that um, package. And of course, it's going to take a second, but uh, you can check out that link. So here's some of the expectation examples. I don't, I don't necessarily think it's going to be worth our time to go through all of these because some of them are pretty straightforward. But one that you're probably going to use quite a bit is uh, expect equal. Um, that's just going to check equality. Uh, again, equality, you know, if you're doing some like numeric equality, there might be some um, you know, like numeric tolerance. So you got to think about 
uh, you know, what level of numeric tolerance you want within your expectation if you're going to do expect equal, but you're going to use expect equal quite a bit. Um, there's other ones to capture errors, warnings, and messages. Um, you know, it's going to be looking for specific things. Uh, what's nice about expect error and expect warning, expect message is there's additional arguments that you can provide um, to make sure that you are capturing a valid error because, you know, an error could be anything, right? It could error because it's the wrong thing. But if you want a specific error, you can select like a specific like um, regex expression to capture that specific error that you're looking for or that specific message that you're looking for. Um, snapshot testing. Uh, this is used in cases where it's very hard to capture it or to capture like it's 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 used in cases where it's very hard to capture like a specific binary assertion. Um, so like I found like snapshot testing to be the best in the context of shiny, um, like when you're doing shiny development, because what you're basically going to do is with a snapshot test, what you do is is you have your function return something. And then it's basically taking a snapshot of what gets returned. And then it's going to use that snapshot file in future tests that you run. And if there's any differences between when you last run it and when you run it again, then it's going to flag an error. Now, that object could be anything. Um, for example, with Shiny, it was kind of interesting to talk about snapshot testing because Shiny at its core is just outputting HTML elements. And so what you can do is you can like say like, okay, my shiny app should pump out this specific HTML. And if that HTML changes the next time that I run these tests, then flag it as failing. Um, snapshot testing can be very, it can be kind of flaky at some times, depending on the certain context, but it can be very useful in cases where it's very hard to like capture what your expectation is. And what's nice about this too is as well is, is like, if it does fail, it will ask you if you want to update your test file or if you want to update your snapshot. So, and then also know that there's those several like convenience functions that are out there. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I highly suggest looking at them. Um, you know, there's some convenience functions out there that could help uh, like uh, make your, make your syntax a little bit less verbose. Um, a good example would be like expect, expect length. So you could do expect equal where you wrap your object in length and then you know pass along what your expected length is going to be and run the test. But with expect length, you can just pass in you know, your object and then the length number. So I do highly suggest looking at these different convenience functions because they just make your syntax a little less verbose. So, so what questions do people have regarding um, some of these expectation examples? Does anybody have their 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 favorite expectation or their their favorite expect um, function? I'm kind of partial. I think to I'm expect. lazy. Oh, go ahead. Go I'm ahead. always lazy, and I end up making it like expect true, and then I just make the condition the thing that I want. Um, but that's not the best way to make use of test that, is it? <laughs> Uh, I get, okay, so I'm guessing like you run expect true, you run your function, I guess you got an example? Like if I wanted the thing to be equal, I would just use expect true and then have the condition this, like the output from the function is equal to the thing that I want, rather than having like the two things. Or um, like class of this is equal to error, or you know. Oh, I see what you're saying. Or the oh. length, you know, same same as like expect equal. There, it would just be like the condition length of the object is equal to n, and then it would be under an expect true rather than. But that, yeah, I know I'm missing out on all the the fun test of that functionality there. Oh, I see what you're doing. Okay. Does anybody have any comments about that? I mean, like, I, I, it works, right? Like, it's working. Like, it's you're meeting your expectation. I'm, I'm just like, I'm a little. I'm just trying to figure out if there's any issues with doing that.
Hmm. I don't know. Cause like the one thing that I'm like concerned about with that is, is like, if the, I don't know, maybe, I, maybe I'm overthinking this, but like what happens in cases, like if you were, if you have something that's like in a vector, right. And it returns, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of it. Like what if it returns like a length of like true, false, true, false. And then it's just returning that first object, which was either true or false. I don't know if that's the case in, in the stuff that you work in, but that's like what I'm like concerned about. Yeah, that's, that's true. If it's, if it, if the class is unexpected and then the comparison isn't right, that's true. That could throw a weird, it could pass for like falsely, right? Like, and then like, oh, go ahead. Well, and then that's like where expect match comes in, right? Like if you're, if you're expecting like a specific like character vector with a specific thing in, you know, you could like make that test more specific. You know what I mean? I guess that's where I'm getting out with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess these are all sort of like, they've got little wrappers within. So the arguments aren't just like, this is equal to that. It's it's sort of wrapping like a, I don't know, a string comparison or like a string detect or whatever, right? My favorite one is like, cause I do a lot of like data wrangling. And so like the test I was thinking of is like, if I'm doing a lot of data wrangling in a package or something, um, like there's like an expect named, I can't remember what it is, but like, it just makes it easier. Like instead of expect equal, it would be like, you know how you would do like the data object wrapped around names. And then you would have like a vector of names here. And then it just, it just simplifies it by doing, you know, instead of having to do names, yeah, you can yeah. Just wrap it a function names. for you. Yeah, yeah. And I think it too well as well as it like it also makes it very clear on what you're expecting, right? Like easy you know, to read here, for the yeah. Because sure. it goes goes back to that idea of like documentation, right? Your tests are documentation as well. So I don't know. That's just my viewpoint, but take that with a grain of salt. Well, I'm having I'm 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 having a hard time separating like user data validation so like like you know you're expecting a string and they pass you a integer or you know a, a numeric value and that doesn't match what you're expecting to see testing is like the other side of the puzzle right you're you're you as the developer you're validating or you're ensuring that the com compute uh, computation matches what you've designed it to do um Kevin comes to mind every time I'm thinking about this, his horror stories of database errors. And I'm, I'm trying to separate in my head what we're trying to validate for user data input so that they're not going to break something versus I'm testing my own code with these scenarios to ensure that whatever expectation my user enters, I've got things built around so it won't happen. Um, does that make sense? Like the, I'm, I'm confusing the front end versus the back end side of, of the software development life cycle. Like the data masking or, or, or uh, uh, providing some argument that says this doesn't match the expectation that I have, throw an error. Well, that's not the same as testing. That's just writing your software or writing your, your code to make sure that your users are entering what you're asking them to enter. Is that, am I making sense in the in the argument? It's definitely on me, and I'll I'll try to do my best to separate the two. No, I think I think you're you're on you're on track. Like validation, right? Like you can use. I remember, you know, I think I remember like expect. You can use these expect functions for like user validation or user input validation in the shiny context. Well, you can throw errors. You, you like, you can throw an error back to the user to say, Hey, that doesn't match the expectation of what I'm asking. Please enter it in this format, right? That's more validation. That's not so much testing to make sure that the data entry is being managed properly by the, the logic that you're writing. Yeah. Cause it's going back to that. Itself. Like what is, what is testing, right? You're, you're testing the behavior of your system system in this case is our package and if you go a little bit more specific it's the 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 you know the the behavior of our functions or the are the properties of our objects so yeah yeah there's that that split i think that's kind of gets murky too right like 
these expectation functions can definitely be used in other contexts outside of just like testing your system again, testing well, your package. So I, I, we, we talked about this earlier in different operating systems and the management of that memory in those other operating systems. R doesn't matter. The R kernel is going to operate regardless on if it's on Windows, if it's on Mac, if it's on Linux. My curiosity is the management of those objects in memory does the various operating systems differ? And I don't see any differences in writing the test function to accommodate that operating system that you're you're deploying it on. Um, because I think that the the kernel itself is is what we're what we're writing these tests for, that the logic of of I'm passing this input or I'm 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 calculating some object ingesting a vector and expecting something, you know, uh, an output. Um, your comment about the data wrangling and the, and the ingestion, the list of names, et cetera. Um, there's no difference between the operating system, right? I haven't seen anything that says, if you're on Windows, use this function instead. I, I don't see that differing amongst all of this. I, I think what, what I was getting at is like, you know, when you're, when you're writing tests, especially like given the example that I was doing with like your, like if you're producing some type of like tibble from some data wrangling, like your function, the purpose of the function is to do some data wrangling and it's going to output a tibble, right? So basically you're basically writing a test to be like a safety net for future development. So if you want to say like you want to add a feature or, you know, I have one of my coworkers add a feature in some way they still have that test to know that they can run it, that if they make a change, add a feature or something, and that test fails, then you, you've messed something up downstream. And so you need to either fix that to pass the test or revert back. So, but I understand where you're coming at. And I think there's a little bit like, especially in that advanced testing technique stuff, when it starts talking about like your tests need to pass in different operating systems. And, you know, there's definitely probably some I'm not real familiar with it when I read that section of the book that I could fully speak to it, but I like, I, I understood it. And there's other, there's services that are available to, you know, check, like, are your tests passing in different environments? So cool. So the next question is, is like, well, what should we test? Well, um, the book quotes this, whenever you are tempted to type something into a print statement or a debugger expression, write it as a test instead. And so um, the book kind of quotes Martin Fowler on this. Um, you know, it, it kind of goes a little bit further and it says like, we should test the external interface of your function. Now, I really didn't understand this statement and maybe somebody can clarify for clarify this for me. What does it mean by the external interface of our function? Is that meaning like the returned objects or the properties of our returned objects? I didn't really fully understand what it meant by like external interface. And we want to take a stab in the dark. Like, I didn't understand that statement. I was like, what do you mean the external interface? Like, do you mean like the parameters that we pass into it. So like how the parameters change affects. So I didn't really understand what the statement was it about. So I put a question mark to be like, do you mean the returned objects that gets returned? Because that's what a function does is it takes inputs, produces some type of computation and then outputs something. And so. The first thing that, oh God, sorry. No, I, that, that that's what I was thinking. I mean, I'm just thinking out loud right now. Aaron was gonna. Jump in oh, real quick. Yeah, no, I was just going to. Say, I think it means that if you wrote a function that is supposed to do an addition, then you should test the addition part and not how the addition is done. So you could like change how the addition is done, but the function will still do what it is supposed to do. So you can like refactor the code and your test will still pass. So your test should be for the intent of the function, not the operation of the function. Oh, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Like, what is the general intent of getting is returned, not how it gets to that final, that final bit. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Because the, the word interface just kind of threw me off because interface makes me think like, you're interacting with the function, but it's, 
yeah so I, I don't know the terminology kind of threw me off but i appreciate that because I, I was that, and that makes a lot of sense now what i was driving for is the uh different libraries or drivers that would pass that information into your your function right uh, the source of where it's coming from um thinking like you know reading in a pdf or uh excel files csv files json data right those are external to the function itself they're they're attributes coming in mm -hmm. and it would it would support what Aaron was saying is you're testing the integrity of the information as it goes into the function not the actual operation of the function did I state that correctly Aaron how you were commenting yeah I think so yeah yeah I guess if we were to maybe talk about an example like a concrete example maybe would be like if you write a function for doing a multiplication you could just write like x multiplied by y and you could write test for that function that 2 multiplied by 2 returns 4 but at some point you might think that oh, the other way of doing multiplication is actually faster you could do like log x plus log y so you could rewrite the function to make it more efficient and your tests will still pass because your function still does what it is supposed to do, even though how it does it is different. Hmm. I guess that's uh, like my understanding. I don't actually know. What no, no, that's that. No, I think that's, 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 that's excellent. <laughs> that's, that, no, that's excellent. <laughs> well, I was thinking, I was thinking, I was thinking, I was thinking of, of the example when you were talking like filtering, right? Like, you know, you could create a function to filter. You could filter many ways, right? You could filter using tidyverse. You could filter using base R. Um, so, like your your function's still doing the same thing, but like you said, you could refactor it in any way. So, like testing how it's actually doing the filtering is not what you want to do. It you want to test the like output of it. So, but I liked your example of it. That 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 definitely helps clear it up quite a bit. Um, you want to make sure that you strive to test each behavior in one and only one test. So again, you know, really it's unit testing. So you really want to break it down. And remember, it goes back to that concept of like, if you're having a hard time writing your tests for your functions, that might be a good sign to you. Like, Hey, maybe I need to refactor my function to make it more simple, you know, to simplify the function. Cause again, testing should be, should be easy. <laughs> um, well, I shouldn't say it should be easy, but it shouldn't be overly complicated where you have to do a lot of hacking to get your testing to work because that might be a sign for you that your function's too complex and maybe you need to refactor it. And then there's this idea of avoid testing simple code that you know will work. And so this really kind of goes to the idea of like the value of knowledge, right? Like you could write a test for this function that does two plus two, right? But two plus two, you know, will always evaluate to four. And so why would you write a test for that? I mean, you can, but there's just no value in that knowledge, right? We know it's always going to work. Now, the book kind of says like, okay, just be careful with that because sometimes you're going to think that code's always going to work in certain situations and it may not. And so you, it's kind of a balance to, to figure out like, okay, what is your value of knowledge? And I kind of go back to this like coding principle of, of YAGME, you know, you aren't going to need it, right? And so like, and we'll talk a little bit about test coverage here in a second, but um, you know there might be situations where, like, yeah, some type of behavior uh, you might want to test for, but it's not very valuable for what you're specifically doing. So you you're not going to need it. So why would you even focus on writing a test for it? So, and then the book always suggests like always write a test when you discover a bug. So if you discover a bug, write a test, refactor the function to you know address that edge case and then if you if that bug gets introduced again through your development or through your feature additions or your refactoring then you then you can pick up that bug again um, quicker so there's this idea of test coverage uh, what is test coverage so um, it's talking about like what percentage of our code is covered or not covered by your tests uh, there is a package called um, I'm guessing it's I'm guessing it's cover, um, but I guess you could probably also call it covar, but I'm going to call it cover. I think that's what the pronunciation is for it. But basically, this is a, a uh, this is a package which will give you a like will give you some metrics on how much of your code is being touched by your tests. Now, when we talk about when we talk about this and we'll talk a little bit about that, just because your code is covered, right? by a certain test 
doesn't necessarily mean your tests are valid. And so it's, it's important to kind of take that into consideration that although you're going to get this metric, it may not be a representation of that your tests are validly testing your expectations of what your functions are. Um, the book talks a little bit about like this idea of 100% coverage. Um, sometimes that's not always achieve, achievable or needed. And so the book really talks about like, don't overstretch yourself by spending so much development time to get that 100%. You know, maybe 95% is fine. Maybe 97% is fine. Or maybe what you're doing in your development is you should be really focusing on just kind of those tricky areas where you know that those, those bugs are going to be present and then, you know, focus on getting those covered rather than getting 100%. Now, test coverage is really nice, especially if you have like, you know, continuous integration or you do PR reviews, because if you are taking code into your code base, whether you're pushing it to the main branch or whatever, and you're about to merge, it gives you a little bit more confidence to know that if you have your, your code that's covered by tests, you're a little bit more confident when you actually perform that merge. Now, again, it goes back to the idea of don't trick yourself into believing that just because you have 100% coverage, it means that your code is valid. Um, so again, it's kind of going back to the idea that, yeah, you can get these metrics of it, just but and it can give you a little bit of confidence to perform your merge into your main branch or whatever. But, you know, just understand that don't trick yourself that this might be, you know, 100% is the standard to say that everything is valid. So um, what, what questions do people have about test coverage? My first experience with test coverage is I'm sure many people had this, like you'll go on GitHub and you'll look at like the packages and you'll see like those little cool badges with like the green. Never knew what that was. But now I do, so it's your it's your it's your code coverage, but don't let those those fancy little badges uh, uh, give you false confidence that your testing suite is one hundred percent valid. So, um, so the the book kind of makes a transition here to kind of talk about some of the high levels or the high level principles for testing, and so we're going to kind of dig into each one of these here. Um, the first kind of concept here is when we're creating tests, we want to make sure that we're going to make our tests self-sufficient. Uh, it uses this $10 word called hermetic. <laughs> uh, hermetic is defined as a test that contains all the information to set up, execute, and tear down its environment. Uh, it does not assume anything about the uh, outside environment. So basically the way I think of it is, is that everything that the test needs to run is going to be, in, in, is going to be contained within test that. So everything that you need for your expectations to run will be available within that test that function. Um, and so knowing the scope of your tests and your test objects is important. And so it gives us this kind of example. I just took this from the book because I think it does a good job of highlighting this is that it's creating this data frame called DAT up top. And then it's gonna run, it's gonna, keep, it's gonna do the skip if, if today is Monday. But then basically what it's going to do is it's going to have the test that code here and it's going to depend on this stat file. But what it's what it's what the book suggests you do is rather than having these objects outside of your test that make sure that you're making them self-sufficient by putting this information inside of your test that functions. So if you're if you are going to skip your test based on this function called today is Monday you want that to be within your testing framework. In addition to that, if you're gonna have this data object within your function and it's gonna depend on that data object, you need to make sure that you include that within your function. Now there's a bit of a duality here um, because you, know, you have the coding principle, do not repeat yourself. If you are creating self-sufficient functions in this way, you potentially are going to be having some repetition. And so, um, the book suggests, you know, don't be afraid of repetition. Repetition is okay, which we'll talk about here in a second. But you're going to have to, if you want to make your test self-sufficient, you're going to have to kind of bend a little bit on that DRY principle. So um, I think this was pretty straightforward, though. Um, does anybody have any questions about this idea of self-sufficient tests? I like the idea, but uh, I don't think it can always work. Um, when I was making the like a modeling package recently, I I was I made some tests that like um, did like the 
post modeling like summaries and and plots and what have you and um and if you make the if you've refit the model every time you test something it you'll it'll take like a minute to do the tests but if i just make the the model once outside of any of the test modules then then it can run a lot faster um but you also get a warning if your test takes too long like you can um you can fail a check from your test taking too long so you uh yeah i i, I see the appeal so you can run just that module but um if you're if you're running your tests by running like dev tools tests then it can um it can mess you up another way yeah I, I think that's an excellent point you know i think i think that's like why they kind of introduced this idea of fixtures which we'll talk about here in a little bit like having your objects pre-made and having those objects available when the tests run and so yeah, I mean, on its face, like this makes sense, right? You, you know, because you want to run just this one little test module by itself and be able to run it by itself. But like you said, like in situations where there's like a lot of computation or it takes a long time, it may not be like beneficial to do it this way to make it self-sufficient. So you have to find another way to make that object available within your environment. Again, going back to that ODA cycle, I keep going back to that ODA cycle, but like, how do you speed up your development? Because if you have tests that take, like you said, that long and you pass your package onto me, I'm not going to run your tests. I'm going to develop and run your tests at the end. Um, but that's not the best way to do that. So, um, but yeah, so uh, we'll get to fixtures here in a second, but I think that's a good point. Like this is good. I think if you have like simple, like simple objects that you want to use, um, but yeah, anything that takes like extra computation, there's better ways to do it. So a good point. Any other comments that people have about self-sufficient testing or having self-sufficient tests? All right, cool. Um, this next concept was this idea of, you know, striving for self-contained tests. Um, so I really kind of think about this as like managing your environments or managing what's in the environment. Uh, so knowing that when you create your tests, you know, know if know when your tests leak objects into the environment, because again, if you are changing the user's environment in some way, or, you know, you're changing the R landscape, if your tests require you to do that, you should be cleaning. Well, one, you should be avoiding doing this. That's number one. But if you have to, you should be cleaning up after yourself. So this goes back to that idea of, of using the with our package to manage the environment, to manage any state changes that you're going to have. And then if you are going to make a state change, whether that be changing an option of some way or, you know, changing, a, uh, you know, changing, uh, changing like the file structure in some way, you want to make sure that if you do have to do that, that you use the with our package to clean up after yourself. So you know, basically it just goes back to when you keep your, when you write your tests, make sure you're not changing the R landscape by leaking objects. And if you do clean it up. So um, the other next thing is this idea of, you know, plan for test failure. So <laughs> I like this kind of point that was said here is like, you will spend time with failing tests. So if you are going to be spending time with failing tests, um, make it easy to read and understand, right? Like, you're already frustrated because your test failed. So why make it even more frustrating by not making it easy to understand? So, you know, don't compound that frustration. And so um, the book kind of talks about this a little bit more by quoting um, the this, this software book or the software engineering at Google, you know, code is read far more than it is written. So make sure you write the test you'd like to read. And so it goes back to that idea of if you do this, it's going to help with that ODA cycle. It's going to make your development faster. And then um, even if it's just you, you know, like I think Aaron said last week, you know, sometimes with scientific code, scientific code only gets run by one person, uh, you know, be nice to that person, especially if that person's nice to you. Um, because in six months, you might be putting a project away and you have no idea where to start. Look at the testing framework. Um, I guess the other thing that was nice about this as well is I've been, you know, thinking more about like how I can contribute to open source software because I've, I haven't, I haven't done that before and I'm interested to do that, but you know, I get intimidated when I open up a package and see all of these functions 
And I'm like, where do I start? And I think like, what's nice about that is, well, we'll start with the testing framework. If you can look through the testing framework and get an idea of what the behavior of those functions are going to be. And those, and those tests are written really nicely with some like good, um, you know, if those tests are really written in a way for people to understand, then it's going to make your development a lot better when you want to contribute. And so that was just my thinking anyways, it's just like, be nice to you, be nice to other people, you know, write, write informative tests and plan for those situations when your tests fail. So, uh, do, 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 where are we at now? Uh, so repetition is okay. We talked about this already a little bit, you know, uh, the book suggests, you know, going back to that DRY principle, don't repeat yourself. It's okay in the situation to have repetition in some cases. I know later on in the, in the book, when it starts, starts talking about some of the advanced topics, um, it talks about, you know, different ways that you can address this repetition. Um, but it just really kind of, the main point of it is like, it's okay. Make these self, um, you know, make these self-sufficient. So if you have to repeat, it's okay to do that. Um, where am I at time-wise? 56. Uh, maybe we can cover, well, maybe two more slides. And I think that will probably get us to where we were going to be for the night. Um, the book also talks about this idea of removing tension between interactive and automated testing. So it's really important to know that your tests are going to be run into two different settings. You're going to have your interactive testing. So like when you're developing on your computer, you're going to be testing it to see if your tests um, pass or fail. And then um, you're going to have automated tests that run. And so a good example of this would be um, if you are going to be submitting to uh, to CRAN. And again, I don't have that experience and I know some people do, here do, but once you submit your package, what it's going to do is it's going to run those tests and it's going to run those in an automated way. And so you need to know that there's, that there's a lot of processes that go on the back end of your package beyond just you doing your interactive tests. And so you want to make sure you do everything you can to remove that tension between the two. And so some ways to do this is to just use load all when you're developing your tests. Um, it just goes back to using dev tools load all. Uh, it goes back to that concept of like you shouldn't be using library calls in your, you know, inside of your in inside of your testing framework. You should be managing your dependencies through your description file. And then the other thing to make sure that if you are doing this in your testing file, you are changing the search path, which could have an effect on um, how your tests pass or fail. And then never, never, never source um, your test files. Uh, this was probably a bad habit that I had to break a couple years ago is I would use source to develop like certain scripts. I don't use it anymore. So um, just stop doing that if you're using source. Uh, let's see, yeah. Important directories. I've got to go, guys. I've got another meeting. Yeah, to I think this is probably the ending point right here, anyways, because I think this is a good transition. So, uh, yeah. So uh, that's all we have. So Rex, if you got to jump off, we'll see you later. Have a good rest of your rest of your day. It's kind of odd to say that, but have a good rest of your day. Um, Thanks. Anybody, <laughs> anybody else want to? Um, I guess we'll stop there because we're already kind of at the nine o'clock mark. Does anybody have any like questions or comments um, about where we're kind of at with? Um, testing. I think we're really close. I think I got a pretty good chunk done. Uh, what to test, test coverage. We talked about high level principles. So yeah, so we're We've got files relevant to testing. And then I think we just have some of the advanced topics to go through. So we're pretty close. I don't, I don't know if we will be able to move on to the next topic or not next week, but um, we're close. We're really close. I don't know. Some of these advanced testing techniques, I am not, I've just never been exposed to them. Uh, to be honest, like I read some of them and I was like, I did not know that this was a thing. Like I was like, I was under the impression 
and this is like my honest, like, this is my honest, like, this might just be my, my lack of experience was like, it's just the, you're writing, test that and writing your expectations, but it is so much more <laughs> than I, than I well, thought. I think, I think you're changing your thought process, right? The, the whole concept of this particular chapter is in relation to changing the, 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 the thought you have in relation to the testing feature. Right. Everyone always puts testing at the very last thought process, or, you know, the very last point of your, your package. Oh, I better write all these tests because I'm going to have to get validated, blah, blah, blah. You should be doing that all the time. Or, or in theory, you should be writing your tests as you go. Oh, absolutely. I mean, like this is, I mean, well, we talked about this last time and this wasn't in the book, but, you know, I, I, I passed along some like readings about this idea of this cycle of observation. Okay. And it was written by this, uh, by this person, Max Kanat Alexander. And he kind of talks about like testing, you know, being this cycle of like observation, decision, and action. Okay. And so like, and as you're developing, there's many of these cycles and how do you, you know, what are you observing? You're observing your, the, you know, you're, you're getting data from your tests and you're using that data to inform your decision and then you perform some action from it, right? And you can make that, that process can be really, really slow if you want it to be. You can make it really, really slow or you can make it really, really fast. And the way you do that is, you know, you focus on your testing because if you have a good testing suite, it's going to give you good information that you can use to speed up your development. I, there was a, so I ran in, not in our different software thought process, but um, in our engineering um, they use uh, a GCC compiler when they're building from source into the package or into the software uh, output. And within that GCC compiler, uh, there's a service called GCOV. And it's, it's, I think it's GNU coverage, but I'll, I'll have to confirm the actual uh, acronym of what it implies. But it's a testing feature of the GCC compiler. So like um, as you're taking source and then building into binary, it's validating that the information as it's compiled into more of a machine operating context, that the output is going to be the same. Uh, if you were to build from source, uh, take the Linux kernel, for example, and you were to build from source, you're going to have all these test validation points. And it's just gibberish upon gibberish that scrolls by your screen, but each one of those lines of text is doing a particular test. And you can go back and audit uh, what was happening. If you've ever built from source before, um, that's a uh, process. I'm familiar with that application only from trying to figure out what exactly uh, the engineers did, uh, sometimes breaking code, but um, comparing those outputs, comparing that that test feature. I can compile it just as easy as they can. So um, if if my output doesn't match their output, what's different between the two of us? What are you doing different or what am I doing different? And so then you can start to debug or, or figure out other details. That's more of a, I don't know, a, a, not justification, but like a, a comparison between, you know, two, uh, two individuals. Um, the GC, the GCOV system is kind of built to make sure that uh, regardless of the environment, you should always match the same output. So. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a theory and I, I don't remember. So I always remember it called IC3, but I don't think that's an accurate term. I need to go back and figure this out, but it goes back to Aaron's earlier statement about the, the, uh, the numeric value input. You're not testing the operation because regardless of the operation and you should get the same answer on the output side. So given your criteria, given your inputs, uh, however I manage this inside my, my environment, inside this function, I should get the same output regardless. And the idea would be between Windows, Mac, Linux, or any other operating system. Um, IC3's thought process is that you're doing the same calculations, uh, excuse me, you're getting different inputs, but you should get the same output regardless. So uh, Aaron, when you were discussing the thought came to mind of, you know, two times two is four, four times one is four, um, one times four is four, like the, the inputs going through the function is still going to give you 
you the, the answer that you're expecting. Or I, I don't know, dividing by zero. That's always a, a problem in mathematics. So in some functions, if you if you happen to get an error where you get a zero into your equation and then all things start to break down because that's impossible. So, or at least I'm not a physicist, so I can't prove that you can divide by zero, but. Um, I think that's, well, I think that's, yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. Like you have these expectations of things that would happen, but like, I guess like the other thing with it is just like, Sometimes you're sometimes the computer is going to give you something back that you don't necessarily want or know, right? So I guess I don't know. I'm thinking out loud right now, so if I'm not making any sense, but like, okay, you could say like, you know, two plus two is always going to be four, right? Like I could say I'm not going to write a test for that because two plus two is always going to equal four. Well, that might be true if your data is always integer, right? But what if you have a floating point value? What if you have two point zero 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 one? plus yeah, 2.000001 and you know that's not always going to return four it's going to be four point zero 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 whatever right yep. and so it's like i think it kind of goes back to the idea when you write your tests you have to write your tests you know so that the computer can actually you know do that binary assertion right mm -hmm. like is it true false um is it true or false right and so um that's just my viewpoint of it but I guess the other thing is like thinking about like from a data wrangling perspective too, like date values, right? Your date value can be represented in many different values. And so like you want to make sure that your function's always outputting that in a certain way. And so it may not necessarily be the operations that you're performing within your function, but you always want to make sure that your function is doing as you would expect it to do. So but in the CIC, am I on the right track? Am I on the right no. track? Definitely 100%. What, what I was thinking is also CI CD. So as you change and commit code and it runs through a process to validate that the changes you're making are accurate, is testing is part of the CI CD process. You're writing the validation steps of running that code, confirming yes, it matches, no, it doesn't match. Uh, yes, the function works, no, the function doesn't work. And your self contained. Uh, hermetic function does make sense of if I change code and I pass it into this process, this, this validation process, as it gets built into source code or, or uh, sorry, not source, what's the word I'm looking for? As it gets compiled into the operation side, um, that change that you make is not going to break other things because your test that you ran to validate the change is accurate. Have you messed with CICD at all or gotten involved in that at all? Aaron, have you messed? Okay. There's a whole pipeline system on GitHub that, that uh, uses like, for example, when you submit uh, a change to the repository and it gets flagged saying that the pipeline, it, it needs some other person to validate. That's more of an authority issue, but uh, you can use those same pipeline scenarios, uh, CICD in the, the Docker container world, um, as you change or recompile your container, it validates that the operation is still, uh, it, it'll still operate. It's still, it's still uh, uh, good code. Um, the CICD process is kind of like that previous uh, action observation decision uh, circle that you were having. I'll try to find a link to the whole CICD mindset, but it takes like sysadmin and DevOps, or sorry, sysadmin development and operations and combines them all into one. So you're kind of touching all these various disciplines, combining it into one because you have a lot of automation that's doing it for you. So. Yeah, CICD is just, and sometimes, you know, as I've been kind of going down this road of thinking about this and like trying to implement some of these things with some of the work that we do, it's like, how far do we want to go? Like, how much do you want to invest into it? Because like, it, you know, in my mindset, like you could write your own custom CI CD pipeline if you wanted to, but like, is that going to create value for your like, you know, I guess it depends on where you're working, you know, like what you're doing, 
like where I work, I don't necessarily know if that's going to be important, you know, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's not life or death where I work. Right. So if, if, if something's not, if a test doesn't pass, you know, nobody's going to die. Right. But in other industries, that's, that's important. Right. You know, I, and that's, so I go back and forth of like, I go back and forth with it. Like, you know, how far do I want to go down this route? Like it's great for my development process. Cause it creates a safety net for me, but none of my code really goes into like a, a, a big production sense, but you know, but it's just, it's challenging. Cause like, yeah, at the theoretical level, this stuff's great. Like you should be doing this, but like at the same time, you got to take in reality, right? Theory doesn't always, well, I shouldn't say theory doesn't take in reality, but cause theory is reality, but you know, it's, it's that idea, right? You just got to deal with the reality of it and like, say like, okay, how much value is this going to create? Cause it's, yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking out loud right now. I'm probably not making much sense, but. Well, my chat window froze. I'm going to try to open that back up. I, I found a, a link that I wanted to share with the team. There we go. That works. Um, no, we, we, we just recently were introduced to Senelec and so four standards. Um, and I'm not an expert, so don't, I'm, I, I'm the last person that you would want to ask exactly what those terms imply. I just know that they're more rugged than even U.S. standards in relation to safety critical applications, the way they're built and the way they're structured. Um, I'm still wrangling in my own brain of why can't I do it that way? That's how we, you know, not, not, not the excuse that that's how we've always done it because innovation is good. It's more of why does it have to be this difficult or, or uh, justification. I have to write justifications of why it is that I want something changed. And it's like, I can't, I can just go in and change it real quick, but then I would violate all these policies. Um, that's a, that's a big problem right now. I'm, it doesn't matter. I, I have a side story that I, I'll share, but it's not important. Well, we talked about this a little bit last time. Like we talked about this a little, like as I've been going down the rabbit hole of testing, like I came across like a conversation between like two web developers and it would basically, it was like this idea, like one person was like, yeah, we don't do unit testing. And the reason why he said he doesn't do unit testing, this was a person who was working at a startup. The idea was like, you know, we, we like, we need to push out features and test driven development slows us down to where we can't develop features. Exactly. But once we get to a certain point of like, once we get to the hundred millionth user, that's when we'll start creating our testing suite. Like we will go hire people to do our testing suite. And I was just like, well, that makes sense, right? Like you only have a certain, like, I mean, I don't work in a startup. I never worked in that environment, but you, you know, what are you saying? Right? Making... Yeah. yeah. But what they were developing, like they were developing like an e-commerce platform. So it's not like, you know, if, if you miss a few sales, you know, nobody's necessarily, well, I guess if you're Amazon, it's really going to matter. But if like you're like some small startup, it's not really going to matter if you miss it. But if you're writing, if you're writing, you know, modeling software for healthcare that, you know, healthcare decisions are going to be made. Yeah. You're going to want to make sure that you have like some testing suite to it, I guess, but I don't know. Uh, well, the, the, uh, is it triple seven, the Boeing triple seven and the, and the, the air, fl uh, the wing flex, there's a, <laughs> there's, there's a whole, whole long story about this, whether it's good or bad. But uh, they did a lot of the testing features from a computer modeling standpoint, uh, and it wasn't until mm. almost the the last stages of validation that they actually built the wing and confirmed that all the computer modeling that they were doing were accurate. But I mean, thinking your thinking your thought process of engineering into the future of I don't need to build it because that's a huge investment. I can model it from a computer's mathematical calculation, prove everything that I'm doing until somebody makes a zero or one error and then yeah things bad things happen quick but anyway i, I, I was going to bring in that example of um we'll see you, aaron, Thanks, um, aaron i actually have to jump off too yeah um, you bet. Here a second but the, the example that i had was um was it nasa and isa like they had this was like probably early 2000s they created okay. some like probe that was going to get sent to mars and like you know, they were, you know, the ESA was using like, uh, was used, I can't remember what, what unit of measurement they use. 
you know, they were using metric and we were still, you know, we we're using oh, you know, feet and oh, inches. That's and so like problem. some of the software, some of the software from like, I can't remember who missed it up, but some of the software like got passed into this probe. And so they were using like feet rather than, or they were using like inches rather than feet or inches rather than like, you know, centimeters meters and stuff or something, like that, yeah. centimeters or something like that. And it just like, it took this like billion dollar project. And once it got to Mars, it just slammed it into the side of Mars. So not cool. Not cool. Yeah. Very expensive. <laughs> this stuff is, yeah, very expensive. This stuff is important in certain contexts. So, Good point, but sir. in, in the land of like e-commerce and stuff like that, it, it depends. I mean, Amazon, yeah. If, if Amazon's testing fails and some features fail, it's a lot of money, but for, you know, for the stuff that I do, it's like, you know the the first link that i sent on chat and you'll get to see it but it was it was the uh colin fay had wrote an entire chapter dedicated to testing in packaging a shiny app and this was one of the features of that russ went really really down the rabbit hole on this topic um so russ is one of i believe he's one of the developers on the linter uh lint r uh package and he was commenting that the when he committed the changes or committed the package that it was the lint R was failing its own lint er process. Like the, the package was testing itself, but the code that he was entering or, or you know, it was valid, but the, 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 the program was failing itself. So he was debugging that. Anyway, he went quite extensive on this uh, chapter of, of testing. It was, it was very worthwhile and it was about test that. So the uh, familiarity with it anyway. Um, and I hope that my ramblings do not deter any of your presentation. I apologize. No, but, I think it adds to it. I think it adds to it. Um, it's just a different perspective. So as a, as a final cutoff and, and this kind of gets slightly sensitive, but I don't know if it's important or not, because it just happens this way. But uh, one of the New York air brake, uh, CCB1, computer-based train braking uh, version one, this application, if you get a fault code, you can throw as many parts at it as you want. You can replace the entire, entire uh, uh, air rack uh, and it will still fail. So the, the, the machinists, when they're doing this validation test or an outbound before releasing the locomotive into service, FRA sign-off, um, the test validation, the comment is that um, if you get a fault code on this application, do not troubleshoot it. As long as it passes the FRA uh, validation test, send it down the track because you'll never have problems with it. You will be in this inevitable, or sorry, in this uh, constant loop of changing parts, chasing your tail, never actually resolving the, the fault that you're getting. And it's just the way that the different modules of this computer-based air braking system interact with each other. It's not important what it is, and I, I, we don't need to go down the rabbit hole of all the various components, but um, anytime I would get a fault from the staff uh, with this error, I'm like, did it pass the federal test? Okay, sign the blue card, get it out of the door. Um, <laughs> we'll send it down to the shop and let, or, or say, send it down the track and let the next shop deal with it. Um, that's just passing the buck. That's not a good plan either, but anyway. Cool. Testing's cool. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll chat to you later. I got to jump off. So have a good rest of your night. We'll see you next week. You as well, sir. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.